Joining me now is David Matlow. He's a Canadian with the world's largest collection of Herzl memorabilia and Zionism artifacts. And he's the author of the regular treasure trove column for the CJN. Hello, David. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. All right, David. Now we're speaking at a time when Canadian Jews are glued to the news, of course, coming out of Israel. But you know, there's a lot of similarities to this time 73 years ago, right? In 1948, right? The British mandate was supposed to end uh, and Arab nations have threatened to attack the new Jewish state. So you have an artifact to show us uh, the first one and tell us about it and maybe about the environment in which it was produced. What I'm going to be showing is an invitation to the Declaration of Independence Ceremony, which took place at uh, 4 p.m. on Friday, May 14th, 1948. This was the ceremony where David Ben-Gurion read the Declaration of Independence. And the invitation, which was for the most momentous event in the history of the Jewish people for the last 2,000 years, was a plain piece of paper typed, folded, delivered by bicycle courier. And it invited people to the Tel Aviv Museum, which is on Rothschild Street, and that's where the Declaration of Independence was read. So why was it in that building? And the reason was that was a very secure building and the ceremony itself, instead of being in a theater or an auditorium or outside, was in a the basement of the building because there was concern that it would be interrupted by enemies of Israel, the Arabs who had already started fighting with the state even before it was created. So you said that it was, I want to look at it for a second. It talks about um, the, the, the location. It doesn't really say whose names are, there's no names. It's just sort of like the collective or, you know, like it's kind of anonymous. It seems weird, no, for there were, formal invitation. There were 300 or so people invited. It was a very small room and it was the invitation says to keep this a secret. But as you could imagine, such a momentous event could not be kept a secret. And by the time David Bidgurian showed up around three or 3.30 to go in, the courtyard in front of the museum was filled with people. People knew what was happening. But to answer your question, what was the mood like at the time? On the one hand, there was great jubilation and excitement, but there was also great fear. The prior day, on Thursday, May 13th, in Kfar Etzion, there was a massacre of 127 uh, Jewish men and women that David Ben-Gurion learned about that at two in the morning on May 14th. So he was seized with this heaviness of the great risk and danger that the enemies of the new state were gathering to do harm and to destroy it as soon as it was born. And in that context, he was sad and worried, as was everyone else in the room, but also jubilant because this moment of Jewish history that we've longed for for 2000 years came true. Now, um, was there any decision making ha that had to go into what the timing of the declaration would be, whether it was the Friday or the next day or Sunday, I should say? Like, why did they choose to go the 14th? It's an excellent question. The UN partition resolution of November 29th, 1947, which caused, called for the creation of a Jewish state, contemplated that the British mandate would end within a specified period. And the British decided to leave as a final shtuch to the Jewish people at midnight on Friday. So knowing the Jewish nature of the state to be the state could not be created simultaneously with the departure of the British. It had to be done before sundown, before Shabbat, which is why the declaration ceremony took place at four o'clock. So then the next thing that happened was, of course, um, they had a, a state and as a state, they have um, a sitting of the of the government. So what's your next artifact and how does that relate to the next steps? The very first action of the new provisional government, there weren't elections for the Knesset and, the, until probably a year later. So this was a provisional government. The very first action of the state, which was re uh, recorded in this book, the Eton Rishmi, it's like the official gazette that we have in, in the Parliament of Canada, 
The very first item in this, this is from 1948, is the Declaration of Independence. And after that, the first law passed simultaneously with the Declaration of the State of Israel was to terminate the restrictions that the British imposed in the White Paper of 1939. The very first act of the new Israeli government was to eliminate all restrictions, all restrictions on immigration to Israel and all restrictions that the British imposed on Jews buying land in Eretz Israel. And this That's amazing. Where'd you get that? Well, I'm very active in searching things for my collection. And both of these are really jewels in my collection. I'm fascinated with how the state of Israel came to be. It didn't fall out of the sky. There was a lot of thinking and planning. And just those two documents reflect the planning and the desire to transition carefully and quickly from no state to having a state. And just imagine all the things that you need to do between the Thursday, May 13th and Friday, May 14th to have a state in, in creation, uh, army, police, telephone system, uh, highways, uh, currency, um, everything, including posted stamps, which is the next interesting and third item that I want to share with everyone. Okay, so this postage stamp that you have is a, as a first day cover, if you want to show it to us, but there's something missing that one would expect to see on the first stamps of a new country, is there not? Yes, well, absolutely. If you look at the, this and those who read Hebrew would see Doar Ivri, Hebrew Post, and it was issued May the 16th, which is the Sunday, the declaration was on the Friday, this is on the Sunday. So why does it say Doar Ivri? And the reason is because these stamps had to be printed before the name of the country was known. It was only when David Ben-Gurion read the Declaration of Independence did the world know that the new country would be called Midinat Yisrael, the State of Israel. And so these were printed secretly because the British wouldn't allow any of the indications of a state to be started before they left. So these stamps were created in secret with a plan, with a printing press that was borrowed on paper that was just scrambled and it made its way into the post offices to be sold on the Sunday. And to most people in Israel, this was the first tangible indication that we had finally our own country, our own postal system. And um, you can see this, this postmark, Hayom Harishon Hador Ivri, the first day of the Hebrew Post. That is incredible. When did they print the next stamps that actually had the State of Israel's name on it? It was uh, the, it was for the high holidays, which would have been in the fall, so four or five months later. And there, there's an interesting a connection between both the Declaration of Independence and the stamps, other than the obvious. The Declaration of Independence ceremony was designed by a graphic artist named Otto Wallisch. He was a prominent designer of, of posters and industrial items. And he was asked on Thursday, May 13th, to design the ceremony the next day. So the picture you have of David Ben-Gurion below a portrait of Herzl with two Israeli flags, he had to scramble to find the flags. He actually had to take one of the flags to the laundromat because it wasn't, it was crink, crinkled and, and dirty. Uh, and he, he designed that ceremony. And he is the same gentleman who designed these stamps. And once he was finished designing and, and working on the printing of the stamps, he then was quickly asked to create the Declaration of Independence Ceremony. And this gentleman, Otto Wallisch, was responsible for many um, stamps and other uh, graphic illustrations of Israel in the early days. Iconic. One last thing I want to ask before we end. Now, is it true that the state of Israel may have not actually been called the state of Israel at the last minute? They had to make a decision, it's like naming a child, you know, usually you know what you're going to name the child, but not in this case. There, there was a debate and discussion. The whole Declaration of Independence that, that was read didn't just create itself out of the sky. There was committees that met in the weeks preceding 
to talk about what would be in the Declaration of Independence, to negotiate it, to settle upon it. And in fact, it wasn't even printed by the time they signed it. The signatory signed a blank piece of parchment that was then only sewn onto the Declaration of Independence at a later date. And so there were discussions in connection with settling all the myriad of items to create the state on that Friday, what the country would be called. There were choices, uh, Eretz Israel, Ever, Yehuda, and ultimately it was decided to be Midi, not Israel. And the world only knew about that when David Ben-Gurion said that the name of the country is Midi, not Israel, the state of Israel. You know, that is so interesting. And in light of what is going on right now, of course, in the Middle East, uh, it's important to remember what it was like 73 years ago this coming weekend. So, David, thank you so much for your treasure trove for the CJN Daily. My pleasure. Be well and hoping for peace and safety in Israel very soon. The same prayers we had on May 14th, 1948.